It's nice to be here. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a photographer, and I'm going to talk a little bit about photographs, just a little bit about photographs. I'm going to show you some of my own work. Good photographs make us stop and pause. They allow us to imagine other worlds, and they bring us deeper into our own. Good photographs allow us to see, to think, to feel. We know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. But photographs can also lie. They can show half-truths. On the surface, photographs seem pretty easy to understand. Anyone can read a photograph. But photographs can confirm our prejudices. They can make us think we understand something when we do not. And here is my conundrum. I'm a photographer who likes words as much as photographs. And often I think that words are necessary. Photographs are not objective facts. The photograph is a piece of the world seen through a photographer's lens. And then the viewer brings her own lens or interpretation to the photograph. To illustrate this point, We've seen a photograph of uh, light bulbs a couple of times during, these last, uh, during this last day. And many of us will see a light bulb and we'll think of an idea. Some of us are actually now seeing light bulbs and we're thinking, this is old technology. Um, this photographer did this set. His name is Jeffrey Norman. I want to um, tell you who did this work. And he put these other words next to it. Is the light bulb poverty? Are we seeing storage? Are we seeing interrogation? So to know the world through photographs, how it just looks, is not to know how the world really is. And because of that, I wanted more from my work. Two summers ago, I went to India. I was there for only nine days and took over 3,000 photographs. But I say this not to impress you. Of that number, maybe 30 at most are worth looking at, maybe less. That's a 1% chance that I'll get a photograph that I think is good. When I returned home, my friend asked me if this felt like my own work. And I said it didn't feel like my own work. These images I made were the first with, with a digital camera. They were my first in color. And they were made outside my own culture. They were also the most beautiful photographs I had ever made. And I, I really, I'm not known for making beautiful photographs. My primary reason for going to India was to make photographs for my friend's foundation that she created to provide health care for children who, who didn't have resources at all. I took many more photographs than I needed for that job, and I had hoped to get something for my own work from that experience that I could actually call my own work. The problem with these photographs was that there was a huge disconnect between what I saw and experienced and what the photographs showed. The photographs didn't penetrate surfaces. They didn't tell me about the people and what composed their day-to-day -day life. This was my first serious project, as I mentioned, outside my own culture. And India was beguiling to me. I, and I didn't understand India at all. It's very hard for a Westerner to understand India. Although the photographs were successful in some ways, I found them much more disappointing than enlightening. It occurred to me that I needed words to accompany my images. I enlisted Nima Avashia, a non-resident India, Indian living in the States with strong ties to India. With her writing, I feel that the work is now mine. I needed her words to reveal the truth about each image. An Indian doctor living in the States who saw my images paid me a great compliment. She said that these are the images that she tries to make when she goes back home to India. I'm going to um, read you some of Nima's writing now with the photograph, and you'll see how much it changes, how much deeper you can now go into the photograph. To know the difference in our histories, all you need to do is look at our feet. I look at our feet and, I am, in, and am ashamed, sometimes of how soft and weak mine look in comparison to my father's, as if somehow toughness of character can be measured by toughness of feet, and having tender feet implies the same about my nature. I look at our feet and think about the stories that they tell, his of sacrifice and mine of privilege born from his sacrifices. 
this is a particular favorite of mine, and, and also I've edited this text for, uh, for this talk. Woman fetching water. I had no idea what this meant, this image meant. I had no idea. I liked the image, I liked the colors, I had no idea what it meant. Water is what make, wakes me. The sound of running water is what propels me from my pallet on the floor and out into the street, buckets in hand, to fetch as much as I can in the few hours before the ditches go dry. I don't bother to change out of last night's clothes, knowing that they will be ruined by the time I finish trudging back and forth over the muddy streets. It's 200 footsteps from my house to the ditch, three slippery stairs down into the ditch before I hit the water surface. I do this walk over and over until I've filled every empty vessel in the house, or until the water stops running in the ditch. I don't worry about having too much. What worries me is the thought that we may have too little. When it comes to water, politicians make empty promises. They drive through the neighborhood before elections, bullhorns in hand, swearing that if elected, they'll install, they'll install running water in the neighborhood, ensure that we have water 24 hours a day. After they are elected, water will run in the ditches at full force for a few days. Children will sail their boats, play and splash over and spill over that fills the streets. But eventually, the impositions come back. Water runs for two hours in the morning, and the plumbers who are to install the pipes for running water never show up. It should be no wonder, then, that water is what wakes me, or that it is also what keeps me from sleeping at night. Rickshaw gods. Figure it this way. If you're going to drive a rickshaw on these streets, you might as well have a comprehe comprehensive insurance policy. <laughs> you're driving a tin can with a lawnmower motor, bicycle brakes, three wheels, and a rubber roof. You drive on streets where there are 10 potholes for every stoplight, where the notion of lanes is non-existent, where the music on the radio is drowned out by car horns. In this situation, one god is simply not enough. Ganpati may be the god of good luck, but this job requires additional support. With Allah and Jesus on your side as well, you might as well make it through the day unscathed. And if you don't, at least there are three possible afterlives awaiting you. <laughs> the bicycle. What you see in front of you is a vehicle on the verge of extinction. My grandfather lived his entire life traveling on foot and by bicycle. My uncles grew up with bicycles and now only travel in air-conditioned cars. My uncles took my grandfather's bicycle away after he had two accidents. He died a little over a year later, still upset over the loss of his bicycle. And while I often feel a mix of guilt and sorrow over that last year of my grandfather's life, I am grateful that he did not live to see the streets so crowded with motor vehicles that there is no room for bicycles he so loved. Flirting feet. We flirt on street corners. We flirt in classrooms. We flirt in schoolyards at recess. We flirt at bus stands. We flirt in front of tea of the tea stall outside school. We flirt on the train. We flirt at movie theaters on weekends when we've gone there with friends of our own gender. We flirt on Friendship Day when we tie bracelets onto each other's wrists. We flirt while flying kites on city rooftops. We flirt on Independence Day dressed in hand-spun cotton, white, orange, and green singing patriotic songs in the college auditorium. We flirt on school trips, far from our families trekking in the Indian wilderness. We flirt on the net, but we never, ever flirt in front of our parents. <laughs> Thank you.